All right, folks, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. So our speaker today is Dr. Joe Odin. Uh, he's one of our hepatologists here at Mount Sinai. And he's also the director of the uh, autoimmune liver diseases uh, section. What sounds good. Something like that. Programs. That's what I call it. Programs. Programs. It's because right, so we have no money. It's a program. Program. <laughs> so thanks, Dr. Odin. All right. Thanks, Jim. All right. So we got three diseases that we're going to talk about today. All right. And just wanted to remind you that not every patient with uh, cholestasis necessarily has uh, PBC or PSC, or the, although those are the uh, diseases that we think about the most often. Obviously, you can have hepatocellular causes for cholestasis, or you can have uh, problems with your cholangiocytes leading to uh, cholestasis also. Right. But the ones that we're going to focus on today are uh, primary biliary uh, cholangitis and primary sclerosis and cholangitis. All right. I just wanted to do a little immunology background since the three things, the thing, the thing that ties these three diseases together are their autoimmune features. Please turn all cell phones no. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Good, what's up? Uh, I'll call you back. It's about Friday. Friday will come when it comes. So the common feature of all these uh, three diseases are their uh, autoimmune uh, pathogenesis. All right. So everyone in this room has some quiescent or not so quiescent autoreactive T cells. Uh, in these diseases, all these patients can be ANA positive potentially, and that's just very common in the population. Five to seven percent of people, if you look, will be ANA positive. Obviously, the higher titer suggests a more active uh, phenotype. Um, and it, actually, there have been studies looking at anti-mitochondrial antibody positivity, and about 0.5% of the Japanese population is positive for AMA. So even though we think of it as very specific for uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, if you just do a population study, you're going to find a lot of people who are AMA positive and don't have any liver disease. <coughs> Um, there are three basic types of uh, T cells involved in uh, these diseases. Helper T cells, which can produce autoantibodies, cytotoxic T cells, which can be autoreactive, bind to uh, epithelial cells, hepatocytes, cholangiocytes, and cause uh, cell-mediated death. And there are T regulatory cells, which try and keep these other two cells under control and prevent autoimmune disease. Unfortunately, sometimes people are exposed to environmental uh, factors which can act as triggering or crush reactive antigens or toxins. A classic example for autoimmune hepatitis is back when they used halothane for uh, anesthesia. A certain percentage, I've forgotten now, would actually develop autoimmune hepatitis after exposure to halothane. Uh, now, in these uh, current times when we're using a lot of uh, immunomodulatory drugs, some of these drugs will actually uh, suppress the T regulatory cells and allow autoreactive T helper cytotoxic T cells to get the upper hand and cause some damage. Uh, in the latter case, this is not really uh, organ or disease specific. People getting checkpoint inhibitors may develop autoimmune thyroid type of disease. They might develop autoimmune hepatitis or other autoimmune features. And one of the reasons why bile duct epithelial cells and periportal hepatocytes seem to be targeted the most often in autoimmune reactions is that they express higher levels of MHC molecules. And as you all remember, it's these uh, MHC molecules will pre present the uh, antigens to the uh, T cells. Is that enough immunology for everyone? Good. All right. All right. So this is just a uh, fun little thing that I do when I uh, get a new patient is I look at their uh, first name sometimes, and this can help you uh, figure out the cause of their disease. So went to uh, Epic, and in Epic we have lists of patients with these diseases, 
I just took like the first five names in our list for each of these diseases in Epic. So you have the group one on the left, the middle group, and the group on the right. Okay. Now you have to read the names. Okay. So the first group of names, which disease would you associate that group with? You're thinking autoimmune hepatitis? Hmm? You're thinking PBC for the first group? Autoimmune. 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 Here. Ah. You're out of it. Let me see if let me see if I did this right. Yeah, I did it right. Okay. So autoimmune hepatitis. Why autoimmune hepatitis? It's all women. It's all women. Younger names. More 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 current names. Okay. I don't know any uh, Ashleys with PBC yet. All right. How about the middle group? PBC. All right, the, you know, Barbara, Patricia, <laughs> Evelyn. I don't know a lot of uh, nieces and nephews with those names. All right, and the last group, obviously, is going to be uh, PSC. Why is the last group more uh, PSC? <clears throat> no, all right. Just because there's more males. Okay. So now you know everything you need to know. Oh, yeah. So these are the uh, 1990 names, 1955 names. You get Pat Patricia and Barbara. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. So this is, I stole this from Nancy Bach. She's good at putting these little things together to summarize things quickly. Um, so PBC, PSC, autoimmune hepatitis, there are some uh, differences in the way they present and the demographic differences are the most evident things. The PBC and autoimmune hepatitis are primarily women as opposed to men. First, PSC is slightly more men than women. Uh, the age of uh, diagnosis is uh, different for the uh, diseases. Autoimmune hepatitis, there's actually two peaks for autoimmune hepatitis. One is at uh, the younger age, around 20, and then there's another peak around uh, 40 <clears throat> or so for uh, autoimmune hepatitis. And PSC is a little bit more all over the board, but it tends to be younger patients primarily for uh, PSC. PBC, you really don't see any younger patients. Really, the, there was one case of a 13-year-old girl with a PBC, but I think she's the only teenager ever to get PBC. Really, it's primarily like after uh, age 30 or so when you first diagnose patients with PBC. Uh, the cells targeted are different, so you see more of a uh, cholestatic picture in uh, PBC and PSC because the cells that are being targeted are uh, the biliary epithelial cells. Uh, the big difference is in PBC, you get mostly inflammation around this bile ducts, whereas in PSC, you get this stricturing phenotype with a lot of fibrosis. And that's why you can see uh, cholangitis, bacterial cholangitis in uh, PSC because of the stricturing type form of the disease where you don't see that in uh, PBC. Uh, the other bad thing about PSC is for some reason, those patients will develop cholangiocarcinoma, whereas you rarely see cholangiocarcinoma in PBC. And because of the cholestatic nature of the uh, diseases, the enzyme elevations are different for the diseases. Alphas and GGTP are expressed along the biliary epithelial cells, so those are more specific for the cholestatic diseases. Uh, the autoantibodies are different as well. No one's satisfactorily explained why anti-mitochondrial antibodies are specific to a PBC as yet. Uh, PSC, you more often see these atypical P anchors in PSC, similar to what you see in patients with ulcerative colitis. And indeed, you all know that there's about a 70% uh, of patients with uh, PSC have some uh, little bit of colitis, uh, maybe not full-blown ulcerative colitis in most of them, but if you do a biopsy, you usually find at least microscopic colitis. And for autoimmune hepatitis, there's actually uh, two types. The first type is the uh, anti-smooth muscle antibody or anti-nuclear antibody positive ANA. Uh, type 2 is the anti-LKM positive. And the anti-LKM positive uh, type of P autoimmune hepatitis is mostly seen in uh, younger patients or in Europeans for some reason. How many people have actually diagnosed somebody with type 2? Oh, well, that makes sense for you, <laughs> younger patients. Okay. How, many, how often do you get those? I would say there's probably like one in eight. 
Okay. So I, I've gotten one in 20 years. So. Okay. All right. All right. So for this uh, audience, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on uh, diagnosis and presentation, but more wanted to talk about uh, refractory uh, cases, which is what people usually come to my office to talk about. Okay. Uh, the diagnosis is really not all that uh, difficult. Uh, for PBC, you need to have two out of th three things be positive. You need uh, elevated ALKFAS or GGT, antimitochondrial antibodies, or liver histology that's consistent with uh, PBC. And the classic feature is this uh, florid duct lesion where you see lots of lymphocytes surrounding damaged bile ducts. Unfortunately, you rarely actually see this. Oftentimes, what you see is a normal looking uh, biliary tree without any inflammation. And actually, a normal looking tree is actually consistent with early PBC. So, just because your biopsy is normal doesn't mean they don't have a PBC. Uh, for PSC, as we mentioned, it's more of a uh, fibrosin type of a disease. Uh, the diagnosis of PSC is more sort of uh, 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 ruling out other possible causes of uh, stricturing of the bile ducts, you know, gallbladder disease, gallstone disease, are the other things that can cause stricturing of the biliary tree. And then there's a slew of other things that can cause secondary sclerosis and cholangitis. You rule out all those, and if they fit the classic picture for PSC, that's good enough for a diagnosis of PSC. Uh, where it gets tricky is if they have an MRCP that doesn't show the typical pruning or stricturing of the biliary tree, but they have a liver biopsy that shows this damage and fibrosis of the small ducts. Uh, this is what we would call small duct PSC. It has a much more benign course, but these patients still need, do need to be followed for possibility of developing cholangiocarcinoma in the future. And if some of them do transition into classic PSC where you can see damage on a MRCP or ERCP. Uh, autoimmune hepatitis. Diagnosis is a little bit trickier. You have to see uh, features that suggest autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, for us, it's mainly ruling out viral causes of liver disease, a positive A and A with elevated AST and ALT, and then doing a liver biopsy, which shows classically this interface hepatitis with a lot of uh, inflammatory cells along the edge of the <coughs> along the edge of the portal tract. And there are uh, criteria that have been published to help you make the diagnosis. But one of the important features is if you suspect autoimmune hepatitis, do they respond to prednisone? Since over 90% of patients respond to, to prednisone, that can be actually be uh, helpful in making the diagnosis is actually starting treatment on patients. Uh, as far as ERCP, there's a nice picture that I got. I think that was from uh, Jawad showing uh, extra uh, hepatic uh, bile duct stricturing. Does anyone here have a lot of questions about the uh, diagnosis of uh, these diseases? Or no one's going to, someone has to ask about overlap. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there can be overlap between these diseases. Uh, the most common uh, overlap that's seen is between autoimmune hepatitis and PSC in children. Is that true? Good. You agree? Okay. And I've heard that some children can go from one year having PSC, and then the next year everything looks like it's autoimmune hepatitis or the reverse. Okay. That doesn't typically happen in adults. In adults, if they have overlap between the two diseases, it usually kind of stays that way. Uh, you do sometimes see overlap between PBC and autoimmune hepatitis as well. And one of the mistakes that a lot of the local doctors make is that they assume that if you have a patient with PBC and the AST-ALT goes up, that means they have overlap with autoimmune hepatitis. What you really need to do is uh, do a biopsy to show that they have the interphase hepatitis that's classic for autoimmune hepatitis. You can't really go just by a biochemical features alone. Now, very rare do you see patients with both PBC and PSC at the same time. Uh, a lot of people ask, which disease do you treat first? Uh, if they have overlap, I don't think it really matters what you uh, treat first, but it's usually uh, helpful to uh, treat autoimmune hepatitis first, and since that has the 
greater possibility <laughs> of uh, developing uh, serious flares and leaving, leading to acute liver failure. Um, on presentation, the big difference between these diseases is that autoimmune hepatitis has a very variable presentation anywhere from fulminant liver failure all the way to uh, cirrhosis, whereas PBC is usually found incidentally when someone notices the alkaline phosphatase is elevated incidentally. Uh, PSC can present that uh, with a cholangio, uh, sorry, with cholangitis, uh, but sometimes that is just picked up on abnormal LFTs as well. Um, uh, one other thing about the uh, PSC, in addition to screening for uh, inflammatory bowel disease, initially you should also screen for cholangiocarcinoma right away because patients can develop the cholangiocarcinoma at any point of the uh, disease, whether it's at the beginning or at the end. They don't necessarily have to be cirrhotic to have cholangiocarcinoma. Right. So uh, just for your older people here, P primary biliary cholangitis used to be known as primary biliary cirrhosis. Does anyone know why the name of the disease was changed? Cirrhosis is scary. Right. Cirrhosis is a scary word, and patients didn't like being told they had cirrhosis when they didn't actually have cirrhosis. Originally, when the disease was diagnosed, most of the patients were cirrhotic, so that's how it got the cirrhosis in the name. But these days, with earlier detection and treatment, most people don't develop cirrhosis, and that usually has a fairly benign course if it's catched caught early. Okay. Um, the number of patients being transplanted for uh, PBC has steadily gone down over the last decade, and this is presumed to be due to the introduction of ursodeoxycholic acid for treatment in the late 90s. Um, it does significantly lower alkaline phosphatase levels, it prolongs survival, it's well tolerated, and it slows uh, histologic progression. And this has been shown in a number of randomized control trials. Uh, Unfortunately, there have been a couple of meta-analysis studies done, which included like every trial ever done in PBC. <clears throat> when you include every trial ever done, it doesn't really show a significant benefit. But I don't really have a lot of faith in the meta-analysis. I trust more the higher quality randomized control studies that show a positive effect. Um, and there are several studies out there uh, looking at criteria to uh, predict what's a uh, good response to ursodeoxycholic acid. And all these studies are looking at alkaline phosphatase levels. And basically, if you can get the alkaline phosphatase level below two times the upper limit of normal and keep the uh, bilirubin in, in the normal range, those patients have a good prognosis. You don't really have to contemplate uh, alternative therapies for those patients. And because PBC is such a slowly progressive uh, disease, the FDA has agreed that you can use alkaline phosphatase as a surrogate marker for clinical endpoints and trials for PBC. Because you know, the approval, <coughs> once they prove that alcoholic acid was some part age, so in other words, are they going to require evidence of long term benefit and outcomes to? I know. The drug? Before they what? Before they. The issue of full approval. Okay. And I know it's FDA approval. Yeah. So they are doing a long term follow up study. I don't know the ins and outs of yeah. what the FDA is going to require and the long term outcomes. Because that's probably the way Nashcross would be approved. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as I didn't know that it was a conditional approval. I don't know if it is. Okay. Either. All right. Um, Yes. So we've always known that there is a subgroup of populations that are either intolerant of ursodeoxycholic acid or don't uh, respond to ursodeoxycholic <laughs> acid. Uh, but over 20 years, no new drug was introduced. However, a lot of drugs were uh, tried. Any drug that seemed to have any immunomodulatory effect has been tried in uh, PBC over the years. You would think that steroids would be useful. Uh, steroids do lower alkphos levels, but they cause so many side effects in these patients that they were deemed uh, more harmful than beneficial. And you can see a long list of other immunosuppressive drugs that have been used. Uh, there are also drugs that increase uh, cholelysis have been tried. 
And currently the ones that are undergoing clinical trials are these FXR agonists, except for beta-colic acid, which Scott mentioned has been approved recently. And there are a number of uh, PPAR agonists which are under study. The phenofibrate and bezofibrate have been around for a long time. There really haven't been large quality, good quality studies to show that they're actually beneficial in PBC. Um, there's a lot of interest in FXR and PPAR agonists, not only in uh, cholestatic liver disease, but also in uh, NASH. These uh, regulate not only bile acid synthesis, but also lipid carbohydrates and inflammation as well. Uh, the POISE trial was the trial of the colic acid a couple of years ago that led to its approval by the FDA. And in this trial, it was alkylphosphatase of less than 1.67 was kind of used as the cutoff for entry into the study. 47% <coughs> of the uh, patients achieved the uh, composite endpoint for the study. And since 2017, Ocalva has been available as a second line treatment for PBC. And basically, it's the first new drug approved in 20 years. And the long-term follow-up study is uh, the COBOL tr trial, which is looking at uh, transplant-free survival as the endpoint. Um, so the most important thing I think to know about using Ocalva is that it has to be dosed according to a PBC stage. Uh, the drug levels will get very high within the liver in patients with a stage three or stage four liver disease. So the actual recommended uh, dosage in patients uh, with a child pew class B or C is uh, five milligrams uh, weekly. Right. There are a number of cases where I guess Practitioners didn't read the uh, label and were giving the drug every day in patients with uh, decompensated cirrhosis, and a number of them uh, developed uh, liver failure and died. And it was seen also occasionally in patients with uh, stage three liver disease as well. So you do have to be uh, careful when uh, using it and follow the LFTs uh, fairly soon after you start them on Alcalva. And the starting dosage is uh, five milligrams per day. If they respond to that within three months, you can leave them at five milligrams a day. Uh, if they don't have an incomplete response, you can go up to 10 milligrams per day in um, well-compensated or non-serotic patients. Uh, there is a tendency to develop uh, side effects at the higher dose. Is it trial for DNC patients? No, that was kind of a, the trial didn't include anybody with cirrhosis intentionally. They based their dosing for people with cirrhosis on animal studies. So there was never really any pharmacokinetics done in uh, cirrhotic patients. Uh, there are some adverse effects. The one that's most notable is the uh, paritis side effect. And when you actually prescribe the drug for a patient, Ocalava does have a pamphlet available that you can pass on to the patient about how to deal with the uh, paritis if it should develop as a side effect. Uh, I've had a few patients complain about the uh, oropharyngeal pain as well. Um, most of the side effects are not all that different from the uh, placebo group. And one of the questions that always comes up in management of a uh, PBC is what to do with the patients who have seemingly refractory uh, paritis. They can't sleep because it's so bad at nighttime. Uh, typically, you can start with cholestyramine, although nobody likes cholestyramine. It uh, doesn't taste good. I've had a lot of uh, success uh, with uh, rifampicin. That's worked well for me, and I can remember the dose. 150 is not so hard to remember. <laughs> Um, you can uh, increase the dose uh, as necessary. The only really important thing to tell them is that their urine is going to turn orange. Uh, other studies have suggested now Traxone may help with paritis. Uh, sertraline has been effective in some patients. Uh, if the patients get really uh, crazy due to the uh, 
Paredes, you can try uh, Mars if you have it available. Uh, and then, <clears throat> what is Mars? I forget, what does it stand for? Dialysis for liver. <laughs> It doesn't, well, it works, it it works for a week. There are actually European sites use it as a transition to cirrhosis and to transplantation sometimes. Right. And then obviously maybe once a year or so, we actually transplant somebody for refractory paritis. Usually it's a patient with PBC. All right. um, so the FSRs have side effects, but the PPARs seem to have a, less of a uh, problem with paritis on them. Uh, there are no, quite a number of these uh, PPAR agonists out there being <clears throat> studied. Uh, actually, the original PPARs were uh, phenylfibrate and uh, bezofibrate. Um, there's multiple different uh, subtypes of PPARs, and depending on which of these uh, receptors are activated, you might get a different uh, side effect profile, and you might get different eff efficacy. So no one really knows which of these uh, PPAR agonists is going to work best in uh, PBC. Uh, we do have a number of uh, clinical trials open here at Mount Sinai for patients that don't respond to uh, ursodiol. And I think Doug has one open now. I have one open. So I think there's a few places you can send your patients. And there have been some small uh, studies uh, showing the benefit of a uh, bezofibrate used in conjunction with ursodaxycholic acid. You can see the number of uh, people enrolled in these studies is uh, not very large. Um, but they did achieve normalization of alkaline phosphatase in 67% of the patients treated with combination therapy. Uh, there were some issues with uh, possible uh, rising creatinine. Uh, there was uh, myalgia is another side effect that you might see in patients with a bezofibrate. Unfortunately, it's not available in the United States. So what's available here is a uh, uh, phenofibrate, and it acts on certain different uh, PPAR uh, receptors than the uh, bezofibrate does. So it doesn't typically have quite as much efficacy as bezofibrate in most studies. But it's something worth trying in your patients. You have nothing else to offer them. Right? And, you know, the studies with a phenylfibrate are, you know, maybe from anywhere from 10 to 46 patients enrolled in the studies. Uh, one thing to remember is you can't, shouldn't use this in uh, patients with hepatic decompensation or renal dysfunction. Uh, there was one very promising study that had an 80% of the subjects had a reduction in their alkaline phosphatase all the way to normal. Right. They didn't show a change in clinical endpoints, but the study follow-up period was a little bit too short to show that. Um, so one of the uh, newer uh, PPAR agonists that's been looked at in clinical trials and shown some promise is uh, Uh I was uh, had a, one patient enroll this, in this study, and my patient kind of ruined the study because my patient developed uh, paritis right after going on the drug. <coughs> my patient had a history of uh, paritis, uh, but she had been fine for the year before going on the drug. So it was unclear whether the worsening paritis was due to the drug or just her old paritis resurfacing. But the monitor was not very happy with me. <laughs> okay. But really, Overall, in this uh, group of patients, there was actually a decrease in paritis after 26 weeks. And there was a mean decrease in alphas of about 43%. Uh, if you used a higher dose, you'd seem to get a more rapid decrease in alphas. But at the end of 26 weeks, no matter what the dose was, all the patients seemed to end up at the same uh, point. Right? And actually, 30% of these refractory patients actually normalized their alkaline phosphatase levels. I think this uh, drug has kind of uh, led the pack as far as the uh, PPAR agonist, but there's got to be at least five or, uh, five or six other studies going on. And this one's actually in a phase three study now. Right. Um, Joe, what, you know, one of the challenges for drug developers is there's a shrinking number of patients. <laughs> um, because you have, what, 40% non-responders, UDCA, then go on a better colic acid of, I don't know, 
two thirds or more respond, or forty seven percent respond. Right. So it, it's a it's a shrinking slice of pie. Do you think we need more PVC drugs? Um, I think we need a slightly better version of the Ocalava. Uh, People are shying away from using Ocalva just because of the uh, few patients that uh, died when it was basically uh, prescribed improperly. But the other reason is that there is a significant amount of pruritus with the Ocalva. Right. So, um, but so it's actually really unclear if the other FXR agonists should have been better. And as is, FXR agonists just released their data, they had, oh, I think, 50% pruritus as well. I think it's PVC still affects or may, may be effective. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if it's that Novartis or yeah. Gilead. I think Novartis. And Novartis Gilead has a different one. Yeah. Um, um, I it think might it might be better, but I think, it's, a, it's an on target mechanism yeah. of action, so it's hard to imagine why you would get right as many of them. Oh, some of them have, uh, are more specific for a particular PPAR uh, receptor. Than others, seems like the PPAR <clears throat> gamma specific ones have fewer side effects than the ones that are, or not PPAR delta. The PPAR delta have less uh, side effects than the PPAR gamma specific ones. So I'm hopeful that there'll be uh, multiple drugs to choose from, and you'll just have to keep trying until you find the right one for your patient. So I think there's a need for additional drugs. Um, but you're right, it's getting harder and harder to find uh, patients with to get into the new trials. All right. Way back when uh, autoimmune hepatitis was chronic active hepatitis. So if you spend your time reading papers from the 70s and 80s, you'll see lots of mentioning of chronic active hepatitis. Uh, some of these were autoimmune hepatitis, but we learned later on a lot of them might have been hepatitis C, actually. Um, so the first line of therapy for autoimmune hepatitis has been around for a long time, uh, prednisone or prednisolone <clears throat> plus azathioprine. Um, for patients who are not tolerant or don't want to go on azathioprine, you can use a prednisone monotherapy uh, starting at 60 milligrams per day. Uh, if you're going to go with uh, prednisone plus azathioprine, you can actually start with a lower dose of prednisone, and hopefully you'll have uh, fewer prednisone-related side effects. Uh, the goal now, according to the newer, uh, newer guidelines published by ASLD, is to actually normalize both the alkaline phosphatase levels and the IgG levels in these patients. Uh, a decade or so ago, we were happy just to get the AST, ALT under 100. Now they keep lowering the uh, normal level for AST and ALT, so it's getting harder and harder to get people perfectly into remission for autoimmune hepatitis. Um, what's really difficult, though, is to get these patients to stay on these drugs for uh, 24 months, okay? And then after 24 months, is recommended you try and stop the medications. And if they have no relapse, fine and dandy, you're in good shape. Uh, the problem is what to do with the 50% of patients who actually relapse within uh, five years of stopping therapy. You biopsy them before drug withdrawal? So the recommendation is to biopsy before drug withdrawal, but patients don't really go for that. You're actually supposed to biopsy at one year. And if they're responding, then continue therapy for another year. And if they're not responding after one year, try some alternative therapies. Um, but I've been trying to do a lot of um, fiber scan on these patients and looking at the uh, liver stiffness as a marker, not only for mm -hmm. uh, fibrosis progression, but uh, the presence of inflammation. Because you know, inflammation in the liver will also increase the uh, kilopascals. Okay. Yeah. That recommendation is more related to understanding that the national history of autism hepatitis will just dissipate in a certain proportion, or do you think that's partly because of misdiagnosis of patients who have an uh, autoimmune life mm -hmm. you know, problem mm -hmm. that certainly responds, but you know, you don't want to commit them to lifelong steroids, and so you stop them, then you're going to capture those who really probably didn't need you know, such a prolonged therapy. 
I mean, I, in, I think the goal is to prevent people from being on lifelong therapy who don't need to be on lifelong therapy. I don't necessarily think it's a misdiagnosis, though. I think some people have a triggering agent that they never get exposed to again. I think the people who relapse are probably re-exposed to some unknown triggering agent. You know, it might be something more ubiquitous in the environment or something. Would you be more likely to stop if there may be some confounders there? Some known drug use that might yeah. So I don't know if we might be on a different slide, but obviously if you know what the trigger is, if it's a drug that sort of triggered an autoimmune reaction, those patients very rarely relapse afterwards unless they're re-exposed to the drug. And they might be slightly more prone than the general population to autoimmune hepatitis, but if you avoid that known trigger, they generally don't relapse again. So yeah, I mean, um, how effective or have you ever had any of the patients that have been on monotherapy? Uh, good question. I think it comes up later, but if you just pay, put a patient on uh, maintenance with a monotherapy with prednisone, about half of those patients develop cirrhosis. So even though, even if their LFT, ASC, ALTs look normal, if you are on need to be on prednisone maintenance forever, you have a poorer uh, outcome than somebody who you can take off of uh, prednisone. Do you think that's just a question about RNA, like a smoldering RNA, or is it that they develop fatty liver disease? <laughs> I don't know. Um, they, have they been yeah. Fatty, like, no, no one's doing biopsies to see if it's uh, prednisone and fatty liver that makes it. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, we'll get to that, but yeah, I don't think anyone's looked long term to see if a budesonide monotherapy is, you know, if they require budesonide monotherapy, does that mean they have percolating <laughs> along on autoimmune hepatitis that's not fully treated or not? Yeah. As we all know that having a normal AST ALT doesn't guarantee that there's no inflammation within the liver. That's why the liver biopsy is recommended to do after a year. I'm trying to substitute fiber scan in patients that don't want a liver biopsy. Um, so up to 25% of patients uh, do need alternative therapy for their autoimmune hepatitis. Sometimes this is due to intolerance of one of the other drugs, or it's due to incomplete or a non-responder. Uh, as I said, giving the drug and seeing response is uh, used as diagnostic criteria because 90% of people do respond to the drug. So if people don't respond to prednisone, you should, as Gene mentioned, consider that you've made a misdiagnosis and there might be something else going on. Um, you know, some other diseases might uh, be uh, misdiagnosed. Uh, Wilson disease in a younger person might be mistaken for autoimmune hepatitis. Even hepatitis E, if we don't test for it, is sometimes mistaken for autoimmune hepatitis. And what I'm dealing with a lot in my practice because of my interest in drug-induced liver injury is differentiating autoimmune hepatitis from drug-induced liver injury or uh, autoimmune hepatitis induced by drug-induced liver injury. It gets very complicated sometimes. And as I mentioned, there are overlap syndromes, especially with a PSC. All right. Um, yeah, so this has some of the things that we were talking to non-responders. Right. Uh, the goal is to pre prevent progression to a cirrhosis, obviously. Um, and as you can see on the uh, pie diagrams on the right, um, people who are responders, 96% of them don't go on to develop uh, cirrhosis, whereas in patients who uh, don't respond, up to about half of those will go on to develop a cirrhosis. And if you do a biopsy, that can also correlate with uh, good prognosis and survival. All right. Um, all right. So there are some proven alternatives that people have mentioned. Budesonide has been shown to be uh, effective in uh, autoimmune hepatitis. It avoids uh, systemic side effects because it undergoes <laughs> first-pass metabolism in the liver. Except if the patient is cirrhotic, then the uh, drug does cause uh, the typical glucocorticoid side effects. So you don't really get any benefit using uh, budesonide <laughs> over prednisone in cirrhotic patients. Um, 
And yeah, this is a study showing the effectiveness of uh, budesonide. In this study, the endpoint was not just uh, ASC ALT levels, but they combined that with no side effects. So you're obviously a lot less likely to have uh, glucocorticoid side effects in patients treated with budesonide. Um, azathioprine, if you're intolerant of azathioprine, I didn't realize this, but you can switch to 6-MP and you see about 75% of those patients can tolerate 6-MP when they didn't tolerate azathioprine. So I haven't been trying that, but I know that Doug does this sometimes and it seems to work for him. Uh, alternatively, you can use uh, mycophenolate mofetil, and it seems to be as effective as uh, azathioprine. Uh, the problem with that is a lot of these are young women who may get pregnant, and you really don't want to give uh, uh, Celsept or mycophenolate to young women. Azathioprine is much safer in pregnancy. Uh, not that I recall, but in general, I, if a patient has a, like more severe, I would go with a prednisone rather than budesonide. Uh, because you can see that they're, if you look at it, the response rate is really not great in this uh, study. <clears throat> So I think as far as a biochemical response, prednisone is still much more effective than budesonide. So there is a need for uh, new therapies for uh, autoimmune hepatitis as well, uh, because not everyone can uh, tolerate Celsept, azathioprine, or prednisone at times. Uh, what's often used are the same drugs that we use in our transplant patients, uh, calcineurin inhibitors, uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors, <laughs> mTOR inhibitors have all been tried in autoimmune hepatitis in small studies, and they've all been shown to be effective to a certain extent. But as you all know, these drugs have a lot more significant side effects and long-term side effects than prednisone or azathioprine. And there have been uh, some head-to-head -head studies. Uh, this one looked at mycophenolate versus uh, tacrolimus in uh, non-responders to prednisone and azathioprine. And there wasn't really a statistically significant difference between the two, but there was a uh, trend for a little bit better response to uh, tacrolimus in uh, non-responders. So on the first two groups, it's, it's, uh, so the first group was just people intolerant, and then it was non-responders. So if the patients that are intolerant, you could probably use either one. Uh, for patients that don't respond to PRED plus AZA, probably more likely to get a response from uh, tacrolimus than from using a uh, salsa or mycophenolate. Um, and there have been a lot of small studies looking at the other drugs showing uh, variable response rates. Uh, it's interesting that serolimus in five patients, 80% uh, showed a biochemical remission in non-responders. So I've had lots of discussions with uh, different people about what to use in refractory patients. And I think you should usually use the uh, drugs that you're most familiar with, you know, where you know what the side effects are. Now, I don't use rituximab because I don't really know what all the side effects of rituximab are. So I usually stick with the uh, uh, tacrolimus or uh, cyclosporin in the really refractory patients because I use those drugs every day. Uh -oh. That's it. No, there was more. Am I doing something wrong? Yeah. In end show. There. Right. And we only, uh, I don't have any trials right now for uh, alternative therapy for autoimmune hepatitis. I'm not sure if Doug has one open or not. He does have one. All right. 
If you have a refractory patient, you might want to consider uh, enrolling them in a clinical trial. Um, and there's just some of the key points is you, the goal is a normalization of ALT and uh, uh, IgG levels. Uh, prednisone and azathioprine are first line. Uh, if they're intolerant, I would probably try uh, budesonide or uh, 6-MP. Uh, for real uh, non-responders, I would consider uh, microphenolate or tacrolimus. Right. Oh, that didn't solve our problem, though. No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. All right, so we got a few minutes for PSC. Any questions about autoimmune hepatitis and your refractory patients? Um, I mean, I, it's a good problem to bring up. I tell them about the long-term side effects, and then most of them get scared and want to come off the drug. Um, right, so I will tell them. Then I usually <coughs> suggest budesonide as an alternative. Well, see, Jen has the worst patients. So I... And tacrolimus is sort of the other alternative, but you know that has tons of uh, long-term side effects as well. I mean, she doesn't, she doesn't have any like, concerning for lymphoma right now, but 20 plus years, she's been on the anxiety, and I can't get her off of it. Yeah. I mean, this is the patient I told you about where her MCV started going up just over like, the past few months. Where it was, yeah. it was I mean, the risk of lymphoma leukemia is still very low. It's like five percent or less of patients. So it's kind of I mean, I've been here long enough now that I've seen one patient, but one patient in twenty years as opposed to the other, you know, fifty or so patients who are on azathioprine long term, it's a decent trade off unless you're that one person who gets the lymphoma leukemia. Usually, so you don't think like, okay, maybe time to try to cycle the drugs or you just keep them on it Just keep them on it indefinitely, unfortunately. Maybe back on that question for like young males that you diagnose uh, with azathioprine or some tests like the lymphoma, would you maybe perfectly start instead of starting it, have to start MMF instead if they're going to be on the same? Well, MMF has the no, same long term <laughs> risk of a leukemia lymphoma as well. Okay. Yeah. So you don't win. <laughs> and a lot of those lymphomas are in the same pool. Yeah, more likely. Yeah. It's coupled that versus the risk of developing sclerosis and need to transplant accuracy. Yeah, no, I mean, the the risk benefit is definitely uh, <clears throat> but uh, it's favorable to use the azathioprine, but you, know, you still worry about your young patients because you know they'll be on it for decades to come. Um, so, PSC, just a uh, much shorter uh, overview for PSC since there's really not a lot of uh, treatments, unfortunately, for PSC. Uh, we don't really know what causes uh, <coughs> PSC, but you do get the inflammation and fibrosis of the biliary tree, and subsequently frequent episodes of acute bacterial cholangitis. And we mentioned up to 70% will have inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, not really uh, Crohn's of the small bowel, but it has to be Crohn's colitis or ulcerative colitis. There's something overlap some people propose between the antigens in the colon and those in the biliary tree. Others say it's just a homing yeah. mechanism, the same autoreactive T cells home to both the colon and home to the uh, biliary tree. Uh, this is scary. There's a 1,000 fold increased risk of cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, if you say this to patients, that's a scary way to say it. I usually tell them that there's a small risk, like 1% uh, or so or less, of developing uh, cholangiocarcinoma. They like to hear that much better. Mm. 
Um, the important part of treatment is there is this IgG4 positive uh, cholangiopathy that mimics uh, primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Uh, these patients can actually be treated and cured with a course of prednisone. And we all know that the cutoff level that's been published is uh, two times the upper limit of normal on two, two tests is suggestive of uh, IgG4 positive cholangiopathy. But you really should do a biopsy and do some uh, staining for uh, IgG4 as well to really show that it's a IgG4 positive cholangiopathy. Um, keep testing. I'm not really finding a lot of these patients who are IgG4 positive. Uh, but if you really suspect it because they have other IgG4 positive disease, such as uh, pancreatitis or something else, I would probably treat them because only 70% of them have a serum IgG4 levels that are very elevated. So if in doubt, I would give a shot at treating them. I don't know what happened there. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, well, this is easy because there's really no medications approved to uh, treat PSC, unfortunately. It's, you know, just like in PBC, lots of cholerytic drugs and immunosuppressive drugs have been tried in PSC, and none of them really seem to have any long-term benefits. Right. Uh, yeah. right. A few small trials are ongoing. This NORA-URSO or NORA-UDCA has actually been around for quite a while, and they've been doing a few studies that have shown some promise in reducing alkaline uh, phosphatase levels. Uh, question though is there's no um, studies that show reducing alkaline phosphatase levels with drug therapy and PSC improves clinical endpoints. I have another question about the uh, integrin inhibitors. Do you think that is promising or? It was just a small number of uh, patients in the original study. They just need to do a larger study and find some clinical endpoints to study. I mean, the FDA has said that alkaline phosphatase normalization or improvement is not going to be adequate for patients with a PSC as a clinical endpoint. So that's what everyone's struggling, what to use as your clinical endpoint in PSC for uh, drug studies. Um, so you know, here's the study. So there was a, quite a significant uh, reduction in alkaline phosphatase levels, but it's not really clear that the reduction is enough to really change clinical endpoints. Uh, and we'll skip along some of the other studies. There we go. So just in the interest of time. Because there's really, unfortunately, not a lot to say about PSC. But there are trying the FXR agonists and the PPAR agonists in a PSC. And it's kind of like a shot in the dark, you know, saying that it looked promising in PBC. So, of course, we're going to try it in PSC as well. But the, the endpoint of the trials is alkaline phosphatase levels. But that's really not going to be enough to get FDA approval, unfortunately. Uh, the FGF-19 agonist is also being tried, yeah. and that there are uh, evolving MR methods. So, for example, the prospective mm -hmm. uh, has a, a, a corrected P1 imaging has a uh, an algorithm for disease activity in PPC. I think in the end, those might provide more benefit. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, we were contacted by the by this. Uh, you put us in touch with them, maybe. I forget how we heard them, but the UK group that's looking at uh, MR imaging and trying to do three dimensional right. imaging and quantifying uh, bile duct uh, size and cool. length. Yeah. So all computer generated modeling, similar to what they were doing in uh, vascular disease. Right. Well, really, the challenge is it's not even clear the disease activity is related to the fibrosis. So even if you have an effective antibiotic, so it's a tricky disease. Unfortunately, it actually affects uh, pediatric patients. I don't know what you tell your patients when you diagnose them with PSC. That's Joe's problem. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Perfect. Okay, any other questions? Thanks, Drew. All right. All right.